Welcome to Aircrew Interview, I'm Mike King, your host, and this is part one of our interview with former B-52 aircraft commander, Keith Shibbin. In this interview, we chat about his time being an instructor on the T-38, moving over to the B-52, his training and how the aircraft handled, the roles of a six-man crew, and much more. If you enjoy our videos and podcasts and would like us to continue putting out regular quality content, head over to patreon.com forward slash aircrewinterview where you can donate monthly and in return you will get rewards ranging from early interview viewings, bonus clips, credited as a producer and much more. Thank you and enjoy. So Keith, when did you first become interested in aviation? I was in grade school. You know, I used to sneak out of class and go down the library and read the airplane books. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. I drove my teacher's nuts. So what year did you actually join the U.S. Air Force? I went through college on a ROTC scholarship in 1980. So then in 1984, I was actually commissioned and started uh, pilot training down at Columbus Air Force Base, Mississippi. So can you tell us some of the aircraft you started training on? Uh, the primary trainer was the T-37, um, probably similar to your uh, jet provost, yep. side-by-side seating. Um, it was a fun little jet to fly, very aerobatic, not the most comfortable thing, though. <laughs> then you had an interesting post, and you went to on into going to instructing on the T-38. Can you tell us how this happened? Well, the... Advanced trainer was T-38, so your second half of pilot training was in the 38. And then I was selected to be what we called a FAPE in the Air Force, stood for first assignment instructor pilot. It wasn't my choice. I wanted to fly F-111s, but, you know, needs of the Air Force and all that. Mm-hmm. So it meant you were close to the top of your class, but not in the top 10% who always got what they wanted. So I was probably just behind those guys, and I got tapped to fly the T-38, which – was fun. I mean, I beautiful airplane, a lot of fun to fly. Got yeah, you know, tired of teaching students after a while because they try to kill you. <laughs> yeah. So, can you tell us what what kind of flying would you do with the students? Was it like starting basic right up to um, you know ACM? Tell us about this. It was kind of in between. When we got the students, they'd already flown the T-37, so they knew the basics, and they knew basic aerobatics and basic formation. We would take them out, and we would do a lot of aerobatics and a lot of formation flying. Uh, we, we probably did a lot more formation flying than they did in the 37, and then we also did some low levels, you know, basic navigation, and a lot of, you know, just takeoffs and landings. Mm-hmm. So how long did you spend on this tour, and did you actually enjoy it? I did. I was an instructor for about three to four years, I think. I did that till about 1989, and, yeah, it was fun, but I was – by 1989, I really wanted to go do something more, shall we say, real world, Mm -hmm. and that's how I ended up in Bombers. Yeah, so that's – that's why we're here to talk about the mighty B-52. So I, when you sent your bio, is. yeah, indeed. But when you sent my bio, your bio over, I was, I was very strange because I saw a T-38 instructor right into training for the B-52. So can you tell us how you got uh, posted to the B-52 and sure. what it was like? Well, I'm kind of a strange, kind of a strange story. I actually volunteered. And okay. at that time, we all want to be fighter pilots. At that mm-hmm. time... The uh, fighter command uh, TAC, they didn't really like FAPES very much. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it was General Creech didn't really want FAPES flying his uh, fighter jets. So it was very competitive for an instructor to get a fighter assignment. Had to be one of the top couple guys that were coming up in your assignment drop. And I knew I wasn't going to be one of those guys. I was pretty middle of the pack, I was mm-hmm. going to say. So it was kind of a choose your poison situation. I saw guys get in some pretty iffy assignments. I really at that time wasn't ready to just go, you know, haul boxes, which is what I do today. But Mm -hmm. uh, at the time I wanted to, I wanted a plane, you know, that flew low and dropped bombs and shot guns. And so it's like, well, if I can't do it in a little plane, I'm going to do it in a big plane. So Mm -hmm. I volunteered for bombers and, uh, you know, the SAC people, they were pretty nice to me when I talked to them and they gave me a good assignment at Marksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana and in fact, to a unit that was all conventional originally, we didn't even have a nuclear mission my first year or so in the bomber. 
So what was actually the role of the B-52 when you started training on the aircraft? Well, when I started training, of course, this was still the Cold War, and our primary mission was to go, you know, go drop the big one on Mother Russia, and we trained for that. And our tactics and everything were set up to go fly a very long way, do a low level penetration and, you know, put cruise missiles and gravity bombs on some target, probably inside of Russia somewhere. And also conventional, of course. So we had a, a split dock, as we called it. We had also did a lot of conventional training. Once again, mostly low level tactics with some high altitude bombing, but we didn't really emphasize high altitude bombing at the time. So yeah, we'll get into that a bit more uh, further in the in interview. But um, so I want to know what were your first thoughts on the aircraft? Because for me, it's absolutely massive. So what were your thoughts, uh, Keith? Uh, that was basically my first thought too. It was like, <laughs> you know, it was like sitting in my bedroom and flying my house <laughs> and working with a crew which in, in the T-38, even though you had a student, it was set up to be a single pilot airplane. You were training guys, you know, essentially to fly single pilot like you would in a fighter. Mm -hmm. Well, bomber, it's a crew airplane. And if anything, it's the, the navigators are more important than the pilots. I mean, I could, I could be Chuck Yeager and I'm not. It doesn't matter if the, if the radar navigator can't hit the target. That's what we're there for. So yeah. in a lot of ways, I drove the navigators to work. Wow. So can you talk us through some of your ground training on the aircraft? Oh, it was massive amounts of academics first. Uh, B-52 training was just about six months long. Wow. And spent the first several months, I forget how long, just in the books. Uh, the systems on that airplane are tremendously complex. Um, you know, you've got eight engines, I think four generators, uh, 12 fuel tanks. Uh, I forget how many hydraulic systems it had, but it had hydraulics all over the place. It was unlike any plane I've ever flown before or since then. Yeah. So what was it like coming from, I guess, a nimble trainer to this large bomber? Like even the training you've seen, did you have to monitor all them systems as a pilot? Yes, absolutely. Um, there was no uh, flight engineer on the aircraft. The, the co-pilot, in a sense, was the engineer mm -hmm. and the... Uh, um, he dealt with more of the systems than I did, but yeah, as the aircraft commander, I was responsible for everything. I had to know how everything worked, at least the stuff that made the plane go as far as the electronic warfare stuff and the navigation equipment that was fortunately the navigators and the defense team took care of all that because yeah. I had my hands full as it was just, just dealing with stuff that made the airplane go. So when you're going through your ground training, did you train with all the other five uh, crew members or was it, uh, were you all separated? You had a hard crew and that was the thing we did in SAC. You always had a hard crew and your crew right. was like your family mm -hmm. and you trained together, you, you know, you sat alert together, you deployed together, you went to war together. Um, now we had a crew in training and I went through training with the same five other, uh, students, um, so I had a trainee co-pilot that was just out of pilot training. I had a you know a trainee gunner, a, you know trainee navigator, etc. Um, and I worked with those guys the whole way through the program. Mm -hmm. And was there a simulator at this time? There were multiple simulators, actually. Okay. Um, pretty amazing stuff for the time. We had there was a simulator for each crew station, and they could actually be networked together to fly a whole mission as a crew. So you'd be sitting in three different simulators, but they had it all tied together. And, you know, 1980s technology is pretty uh, hot That's stuff. That's impressive, yeah. So we, did you find it um, a big responsibility knowing that you kind of, in, I mean, not in charge, but, you know, they're under your command and you have to look after sure. them? Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, it was a huge responsibility, not just, you know, you've got this, very expensive airplane. I mean, you know, it's a national resource. You've got, you know, five five other people that are all depending on you. And of course, you've got to get the mission done. And it was a very complicated mission. So yeah, there's a lot of responsibility for, uh, you know, 27, 28 year old guy at the time. Is that all 27, 28? Yeah. I can't even think what I was yeah. doing at 27, eight, but nothing like that. That's for sure. <laughs> but that's uh, pretty amazing. 
Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about your first flight in the B-52. What was it like, and did it um, live up to your expectations? My first flight in the bomber, they stuck a bunch of us in one, um, and I didn't fly it at first. They had me sitting in, in one of the jump seats, and they go up behind a tanker, and they start uh, doing air refueling, and so my and then they swap seats. So my first time I ever touched the controls of the airplane, I'm behind the tanker, and I don't think this was really yeah. optimum, but <laughs> yeah, it was like, hey, there's the tanker, you figure it out, and uh, yeah, it was pretty ugly. I was flailing around back there pretty bad. Wow, what, why did they put you in that situation? Yeah, it was sack. You gotta be tough to fly the heavies. That's what they always said. Throw you in the deep end, kind of thing. Exactly, sink or swim. Yeah. So let's talk about some of your, when you started training on the aircraft, what kind of flying would you begin with and what would you actually end up with? Well, you would, um, you would do a full mission. My, my second flight in the bomber was a complete mission and that was basically the way the rest of the program went. You would take off, you'd rendezvous with a tanker, you would uh, attempt air refuel, which took me a long time to figure out how to do. I think it was about my eighth flight before I ever actually got hooked up to the tanker. Um, you would go to a low level somewhere, practice bombing. Uh, you might go into a military operating airspace and work with a fighter like an F4. I remember doing that once in training and you would come back and you would beat up the traffic pattern for probably three hours. So all told you might have an eight or nine hour training mission in the last two, three hours of it. You're just out there doing touch and goes. So before we move on, I, cause you mentioned air refueling there. What, how long did it actually take to, like, you know, air refuel a B-52? I can imagine quite a while. To take on a full load, um, which we did in combat, you would take on 100,000 pounds maybe from the tanker, and you would be on the boom for probably 20 minutes at least. And, in fact, to pass my check ride as an aircraft commander, I had to be able to hook up to the tanker and stay on there for 20 minutes with no more than... It was maybe three, what they called an inadvertent disconnect. Now, fortunately, I got the day I did my check ride, you know, the stars aligned and everything came together and I just hooked up for 20 minutes solid and got it done. And that was the end of it. And did it take just yourself or were there all the other crew members involved in refueling? It was mostly me as far as the one actually flying the jet behind the tanker. Although my co-pilot, uh, when I got out on the line, I had an extremely capable co-pilot and he could, he could refuel, which was nice because he could take some of the load off me at times. But it was mostly the aircraft, com aircraft commander, you made your money by refueling, basically. You had to be able to get the gas because you couldn't do the mission without the gas. Mm -hmm. uh, the navigators were very important in actually rendezvousing with the tanker. Mm -hmm. because they had to get you to the right place at the right time because this was all based on timing. Everything we did in the bomber was based on timing. And then the co-pilot, while I was actually back there, you know, sawing on the yoke for 20 minutes, he was working the fuel panel and putting the gas where the gas needed to go and keep us, keeping us in the right center of gravity and all that. A lot ten. harder than it looks. I, I thought at first – oh, this will be just like flying close trail in a T-38. And then I got behind the tanker and realized, oh, this is absolutely nothing like flying close trail in a T-38 because this thing doesn't want to stay put back here. It has a, it has a Dutch roll. And so it, it, it wants to go back and forth. And if you ever watch a, a B-52 pilot when he's refueling, he is, he is just working that yoke constantly that about like this just to keep the wings level. So, Keith, what were the handling characteristics of the B-52 like? like nothing else I have ever flown. And I've flown five Boeings in my life in one Airbus, <laughs> and it wasn't like any of them. It was in its own world, basically. Wow, uh, really? it, it was not hard to fly, but I thought it was hard to fly well. It was, mm -hmm. it was hard to put it right where you wanted it. It had a lot of aerodynamic quirks to it. Yeah, I think this was only the second jet Boeing ever built, so they were still getting it sorted out at the time. You had only spoilers for roll no ailerons and when you made a turn that would cause the plane to want to pitch up so you had to push forward on the yoke every time you turned uh, you didn't have enough elevator to land the airplane so you had to run the trim nose up in the flare when you were landing it mm -hmm. uh, if you didn't flare the plane out all the way it wouldn't land it would bounce off those nose trucks and 
go right back into the air. I got, uh, I think I got six bounces off one once in training before the instructor took it from me. <laughs> yeah, it was impressive. <laughs> that is impressive. So yeah, just uh, what kind of lo- what kind of speeds would you be taking off and landing that? Like, I'm guessing you must have, you know, needed a big runway if you were carrying that heavy load. Yeah, especially the G model, which that I flew, it only had turbojets. It was kind of underpowered. It was a bit of a pig, actually. Uh, I think it became airborne only because of the curvature of the Earth. <laughs> um, but you would use most of a very long SAC runway to get airborne, and SAC runways were, you know, ten to 12,000 feet long. Mm-hmm. Uh, the speeds, I think, you know, I think it took off and landed almost the same speed as the T-38, depending on how heavy you were, of course, mm-hmm. but I remember speeds in the 150 knot range um, wow. taking off. Now, I'm, now I'm remembering back like 30 years, so mm-hmm. you know, someone out there will probably correct me on that one. Mm-hmm. And I remember flying approaches at, I don't know, like say in the 150 mm-hmm. knot range also. But uh, yeah, so what were the strengths and weaknesses of the airframe? Not as a you know um, operational platform, just as a, a flying machine. What were the strengths and weaknesses? Well, it was very stable. Uh, you could trim it up on approach and just about take your hands off, and you know it would stay it would stay where you put it. Um, I seem to recall speed control the same way. You know, you set your power, and it would pretty much hold airspeed. Mm-hmm. Um, so stability was very good. Um, obviously not very maneuverable, you know, it's you're talking a 400 plus thousand pound airplane with, you know, only spoilers for roll control. So, you, you know, you weren't going to go, um, do aerobatics in it, obviously. Uh, the weaknesses, like I say, had a lot of quirks aerodynamically. It didn't have a lot of, uh, flaps. You only had trailing edge flaps. So approach speeds were kind of high, and you're, you had one flap setting. Your takeoff flaps were your landing flaps. They were either all the way up or all the way down. It took them a full minute to go up or down. They were actually electrically powered. So there were a lot of limits on how often you could move the flaps because those electric motors had to cool off. Uh, one strength of it, it had redundancy. This a plane was built to get holes shot in it and keep flying. So you had all these redundant hydraulic systems. It was set up so you would have something to fly the airplane with. You could probably shoot out, you know, three, four of the hydraulic systems, and you might have like one spoiler left to steer it with. But you know, by gosh, it, you'd have something to steer it with at least get you home or maybe get you, you know, at least someplace safe to jump out of it. So it was a bit like a tank almost. Yeah, it's yeah, it's sturdy. Mm-hmm. It's good jet. And as you mentioned before, you mentioned the crew, but can you give a bit more detail about what each crew member did and what their role was? Absolutely, and also I got to put a quick word in for the maintainers because you oh, know yes. maintenance guys tend to get left out of this, and you know maintenance guys were working on these planes for hours and hours, you know, before we even showed up to fly it. So you know, without maintainers, I'm just a pedestrian with cool sunglasses. <laughs> The um, the rest of the crew, so you had the pilot team, which was myself and the co-pilot. And the co-pilot kind of doubled as a flight engineer because we had no flight engineer, so that was a lot of his job. Then you had what we called the offense team, which was the two navigators. Mm-hmm. They sat downstairs from us. Um, the radar navigator is what you guys would call a bomb aimer. Mm-hmm. And then you had just the navigator, so the the navigator was kind of the guy that got you to the target and the radar nav was the guy that was going to hit the target generally mm-hmm. speaking he also was the one that helped keep us out of the terrain when we flew low levels mm-hmm. then sitting oh 10 or so feet behind the two pilots was the defense team you had an electronic warfare officer who was really important guy he was a guy who was hopefully going to keep you alive <laughs> and the gunner, because, you know, we still had gunners on the G model and gunners sat up in the cockpit with us and ran the guns by remote control. And so those two guys were defense, the two navs were offense, and then the two pilots drove the bus. So it must have been a lot of, um, you know, uh, confidence and trust in the crews, uh, you know, just while you're doing the, your mission. Uh, in, yeah, an incredible amount. You know, I've got guys sitting downstairs in a dark closet trusting me not to uh, run us into the ground you know on a night low level you know we might be down you know maybe as low as 200 feet at night 
and they're trusting me not to hit the dirt. I'm trusting them not to steer us into a mountain. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, you know, trusting the electronic warfare officer. If somebody's going to try to lock a SAM on to us, I'm hoping that he can, you know, work his magic back there and break the lock or at least, you know, maybe turn a hit into a near miss. Mm-hmm. Um, and likewise, if things ever got bad enough where, you know, the gunner had to do his job, I hope he's able to do his job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, hope, you know, we're having a really bad day if the gunner's actually having to use his guns, but I was glad he was there. It's nice having something to shoot back with. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so did you actually get much chance to do any practice in bombing? Yes, we practice bombing um, just about every mission, but oh, okay. a lot of times we just dropped what we called a tone. We didn't drop a real bomb. We would go out to a bombing site and they would track us on radar, and we would transmit a tone. Mm-hmm. And then when the, the uh, computer decided it was time to release the bomb, it would cut the tone. Mm-hmm. And then they would score your bomb based on where the bomb would have gone at the time the tone was cut, based on all their cosmic calculations and everything. Mm-hmm. Now, occasionally we'd get to drop practice bombs. A practice bomb looks like a beer can with fins. And it's hilarious. You walk, you know, you pre-flight the airplane and you crawl into this gigantic bomb bay and there's two little beer cans clipped up, <laughs> clipped up in there. But we would sometimes go out to uh, an actual range and practice dropping those. Mm-hmm. I don't think the ballistics on them were all that great. You know, I was waiting to see one go up one time when I dropped it. Did get a chance. Every <laughs> once in a while, you might get to drop a real bomb if you were doing a big exercise like Global Shield or uh, something like that. They might give you a real bomb to go out and play with, but that was pretty rare. Uh, I mean, I think I only dropped a handful of live bombs before I actually had to do it for real. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about the flight deck or cockpit. What do you uh, reference that as? Because uh, I've heard both sides. Um. Either or cockpits usually what I what I use. It was um, not very roomy. You would think for as large an airplane as a B fifty two, but there really wasn't a lot of room. Um, you know, the thing was a flying gas tank, and what wasn't gas was electronics. And then somewhere they had to squeeze people in in the middle of all that. So you couldn't stand up straight in a B fifty two except on the ladder between the upper and lower decks. Okay. So once you got up into the cockpit, you know, now you're sitting in an ejection seat. Ejection seats are not particularly comfortable. These were, you know, as ejection seats go, not too bad, but you're still sitting there for a very long time. And, yeah, it's kind of tight. And it's also very, very noisy. We would wear the either our helmets or the great big David Clark headsets, um, the big noise-canceling headsets, You could not talk cross cockpit like we do in an airliner. If I, like, just turned my head and tried to talk to my co-pilot, he wouldn't hear me. Wow, really? If I stuck my head right up next to him and screamed, he might hear me. So basically, everything we said was on the intercom. So you always talked on the intercom, and so you you said who you you said who you were addressing and who was who was talking. So you were supposed to say like you know, now pilot. Uh, where are we at? And then, you, you know, you, you get pilot nav, we're lost, but we're making good time. Mm-hmm. Um, now, we, since you flew as a crew, we started using, we'd use first names. We weren't supposed to. If you had an instructor on the plane, they'd yell at you if you were using first names. <laughs> but we usually did. Mm-hmm. And was it like uh, all a glass co- um, cockpit or was it mainly analog at this time? Oh, it was, uh, you know, Fred Flintstone stuff. It was um, steam gauges, and we did have kind of a, we had a, a CRT or basically a TV screen. It wasn't, um, it wasn't true glass. You had this uh, TV screen, took up a big chunk of the instrument panel. And what that, here, I got a visual aid here for you. Really? So here's my B-52 model. You see these two chins under here? Yeah. Those were cameras. Those okay. were our, uh, our forward-looking infrared and our low-light, um, you know, television camera. And those, right. okay. could, um, we could look through this, um, 
catheter gray tube in the instrument panel and look out those cameras, we would also get our terrain avoidance radar would be superimposed on that. So it's pretty cosmic stuff for the 1980s. Did it work at the time? Uh, worked pretty well, actually. In fact, the FLIR worked really well over the desert because, you know, the desert's hot and the air is cool, so you got all that contrast. Yeah, some nights it worked better than others. Some nights the FLIR maybe worked better. Some nights the STV worked better. The terrain avoidance trace worked, you know, very well. And we, you know, we could theoretically fly, you know, low-level blind, but we didn't. It could be done. 